The market got better for buyers, that is. Oh, and Gen Z is the next great generation? We're going to get to that. In this video, we're going to go over the single family and condo markets in the state of Massachusetts. We'll also do some interest rate update and, well, some analysis on why rates keep going up when the Fed didn't budge. Hi, I'm Jeff Chubb. I'm a recovering investment banker turned real estate agent. I've sold more than a thousand houses. If you have any questions in regards to real estate, then no, I am here to help. Last week, we talked about the have and have not buyers, but I can also see that with the sellers too. The have and have nots are a little more easier to identify. However, in the seller's market, the lower price points continue to just chug along and are seeing some great buyer demand. The higher price points are involved in a slugfest of worn pricing and property condition. I can't stress enough how important it is to price it right if you are a seller. Don't go aggressive. I know it's a temptation, but it's a temptation that you shouldn't give in to. If you feel like you need to do it, then maybe give in to another temptation, like eating a chocolate cake, because this market is more sensitive than I can remember ever. Well, maybe not ever, but for a while when it comes to pricing. And I think it's only going to get worse as we get deeper into the fall market. Let's get into it all and jump into the single family stats. Another weekly high for single family inventory. We currently have 4,437 houses on the market. We've now seen a 450 unit increase in the amount of single family homes on the market since the end of August. That's a pretty impressive 11.6% inventory built. The inventory tightened this week. We now have 969 fewer houses on the market than this time last year. But here is where it got a little crazy. The inventory gap decreased pretty drastically when compared to the same time in 2021, which was our previous all-time inventory low. We currently have 411 fewer houses on the market than in 2021. So some big movement there. Now, let's have some fun. In the comments section below, put your guess as to what week it will turn when our inventory levels will actually surpass the levels of 2021. A good week if you're a buyer in the market. New listings went over the thousand mark again. We had 1,017 newly listed single family homes this week. Now that new listing activity was only 10 and a half percent off the same week last year without 1,136 homes were listed. The four week rolling average is 917 units. We're still feeling the effects of that Labor Day weekend slow down on this one we had 881 homes go under agreement which was 16.9 percent less than the same week last year when 1060 homes went pending this 16.9 percent difference is after last week's 16.2 percent difference making of a new trend the four-week rolling average is 854 units again the labor day dip is still playing with this data point so when compared to last year's market new listings were off by 10 and a half percent while under agreements were off by 16.9 percent Last week, we had some market balance when compared to last year. This week, we're back to that imbalance all over again between new listings and under agreements. This is why we saw that inventory gap decrease. There were 553 single-family homes that closed last week for an average sales price of $769,000 and a median sales price $599,900. And sales levels compared to the same week last year were down by 23% is there were 718 single families homes sold this week last year. And then months of inventory. This is how we determine what type of market that we're in. Zero to five months is considered a seller's market. With the closer that you can get to zero, the more aggressive and better seller's market that it is. This week, months of inventory continue to grow and is up to 1.42 months compared to last week's 1.39 months. 1.42 months this week is compared to the 1.35 months this week last year. It's still a great market for a seller. But pricing your house right is more important than ever. Real quick, here is my shameless plug. I just wanted to mention that if you are thinking about buying or selling a home, then it would be a true pleasure to help you. Now, on to the condo market. We have 2,503 condos on the market as of Monday. It's another record inventory week for 2023. We would actually have to go back to November of last year to find a week where we had more condos on the market than we do today. We have seen condo inventory built by 13.6% in just the last 28 days. While we're trending in the same direction as the last two years, we did have a little catch up with the inventory gap tightening when compared to 2022. We now have an inventory difference of 284 units, which is down from last week's 315 difference. To put it all in perspective, the inventory gap hit a low point on the week of August 28th at a 208 unit difference. There were 502 condos that came on the market with a four-week rolling average of 439 condos. Our new listing activity was close to surpassing last year. We listed 0.8% fewer condos last week 
than we did in the same week in 2022 when 506 condos came on the market. Yes, we were only off by four units compared to last year's new listing activity. There are 408 condos that went under agreement this week. The four-week rolling average is 344 units, so we're well above that average, but are catching up. This week, last year, there were 453 condos that went under agreement. This means that our pending activity was off by about 9.9% when 453 condos went under agreement. So 0.8% fewer new listings were compared to this week last year while selling 9.9% fewer condos. I'll tell you, when looking at the year-over-year -year graphs, it really gives you the feeling that, uh, well, this year's condo market is pretty much on par with the condo market of last year. There are 231 condos that sold this week for an average sales price of $619,000 and then that median sales price of $510,000. Now, this same week last year, there were 228 condos that sold, so sales levels were off by only 1.32%. Months of inventory increased with 1.89 months from last week's 1.84 months. Any chance you could do me a huge favor, it just makes a huge difference for me as well as the channel. If you hit that like button with that YouTube algorithm, it just makes an enormous difference. And well, subscribing, eh, that one doesn't hurt either. So subscribe. Time to talk about interest rates. There is no way of sugarcoating this one. It wasn't a great week in the interest rate world. Rates were up nearly a quarter of a point. For the average lender, a top-tier 30-year fixed rate is now over 7.5%, which is the first time in 22 years non-top-tier borrowers will see rates even higher. So the Fed didn't hike, but yet interest rates shot up. What gives? Let's talk reasons. The first reason is that the Fed has eight scheduled opportunities to update rates each year. A bond market has thousands of opportunities each and every single day. The Fed rate hike can become, well, a lagging development of what the market has already priced in. Plus, check this out. Traders can bet on what the Fed funds rate will be on any given month, well into the future, and traders have a budge on where they thought the rate was going to be for months. So in other words, the Fed fund rate staying steady was priced into the market. There was no surprise there. So where's the surprise? Why did rates go up then? It has to do with what each Fed member is projecting. With each Fed rate decision, the Fed also releases a summary of economic projections. And among these forecasts is a dot plot showing where each Fed member sees the Fed funds rate at the end of the next couple of years. Take a look at the dot chart for September and compare it to June. Do you notice how not one Fed chair sees rates below 4.25%? and how the majority of them see them over 5% at the end of next year. So in June, the average Fed member saw rates down by 1% by the end of next year. In September, the average Fed member now sees rates being down only a quarter of a point. This is what the market was reading into. Who was it that told you that, well, inflation wasn't done and that rates were going to go higher? I promise you, you aren't you're wasting your time here. It's like the government declared war on inflation and inflation won. The Fed sees the tea leaves, but they aren't ready to admit it. Inflation is going to put together a late fall and winter offensive, and it's going to hit every supermarket, Walmart, and everywhere else that the consumer shops. Real quick, because, well, it's about inflation, and it's about what a lot of people see with the housing prices today. My wife and I had our third kid, and we got a Suburban as a loaner the other day. So I got this idea in my mind that maybe we should just get a Suburban as a third car. I was at the car dealership, and walked up to what was a beautiful Suburban. I mean, it was the last model. It was dark blue. Look at the sticker, 33 grand. Okay. Open the door to see the odometer read 105,000 miles. I literally said F you out loud and shock and just slammed the door, got in my car, drove away. It's the same reason why my wife makes me a sandwich nearly every day instead of me going out. I just can't wrap my head around a $20 per day lunch. I'm stuck in the prices of yesterday. Inflation is literally all around us and everything we buy and use every single day. It's going to change purchasing habits and habits, well, in general. But why is it that people disassociate housing from inflation? Quite frankly, it's stupid. If my lunch is getting more expensive and my car is getting more expensive, wouldn't it make sense that housing is getting more expensive as well? Because the dollar is inflating in value. The meaning of inflation is inflating money supply. So I say all of this because if the government continues to spend money and borrows to do that, then they are in fact inflating the money supply. For all of those people who think housing is going down, I have 1.6 trillion reasons why it's not going to happen next year. That's a conservative estimate on how much the government 
will inflate our money supply by next year, by the way. Are you home prices going to crash, folks? Really making a bet against the U.S. government and our politicians' stupidity? Seems foolish to me. So the Gen Z generation is our next greatest generation. How the heck could that be? Well, when it comes to housing, they surely are stepping up in a big way. Check this article out. Move over, millennials. Gen Z is buying up homes quicker than their older peers. Against all odds, things are starting to shape up for some younger homeowners and would-be buyers, especially for those born between 1997 and 2012. Well, data showed more Gen Zs owned their homes last year compared to the generation before them, millennials, and even their parents. Roughly 30% of 25-year-olds last year owned their home. They cite interesting times as the reasoning. Them working from home during the pandemic and saving a bunch of money living with mom and dad. But what this oppressed upon me was that Generation Z has a special love for real estate. Then I thought about why. It's because they were born between 1997 and 2012. The housing crisis of 2008 is the equivalent to the savings and loan crisis in the mid-80s. To me, it's history, and not even recent history. Want to talk about your own personal real estate needs? Whether you're looking to buy in the next 9 or 90 days, then I would love to chat with you. Just find out more about your real estate goals. And if you're thinking about possibly selling, well, then we can help you traditionally or even offer you a cash offer on your house for a seamless and stress-free sales process, no matter what your situation we can help you get it done. You can also visit us at youtuberealestateagent.com and just fill in your information and then we'll reach out to you. Questions or comments about any of this market data, then drop them in the comments section below. You take the time to watch the video, so I'm going to take the time to respond to you. Until next time.